Coloma. Um, it's been quite a long time. Going back to 1988 when I first went to Guyana. You know, I remember you, you, you walked into the Pegasus Hotel and you were asking for this person in charge of culture with CARICOM and you found me and we sat by the pool hotel and began to talk. You were quite a young girl then, just out of school. Mm -hmm. But you had all these huge ideas that have now blossomed, full-blown into all kinds of dramatic things, poetic things, non-fiction work. What was your journey like? What was that journey from then to now? And what kind of differences do you see between the Paloma then and the Paloma now? Well, that should be a question for you to answer, right? <laughs> I well, I, 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 I see lots of differences. Retrospective, right? Of <laughs> I, I, I'm not that self-conscious. I don't, you know. Um, but I just want to talk about that moment because I think it's a really very important moment um, when I would have met you because a lot of people would have seen me mention you in my writing, in thanks, in books, um, and, and, and probably wondered what why is this person such a constant? Um, and without the explanation um, of that day, that moment, and in 1988, because I, I, I have written something recently in which I say I, I met two tall trees on the same day in 1988, and that was yourself and Tony, who I married later. Mm -hmm. And um, both of you were constant in my life in two different ways. In your case, um, that 1988 meeting was a very important one for me because um, I, it kind of opened up the world of theater for me. And I think that if Carrie Combs Culture Desk could not take credit for anything, <laughs> at least they could take credit for that. Um, because one, I was really searching, and remember Guyana was at, 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 this was a point in time when Guyana was really closed off. It was just beginning right? to open up, yeah. actually. Um, no television, um, I mean, that's amazing to most people, but it was mm -hmm. great for me because I was reading a lot. Um, you couldn't travel as, at will, you had to book a telephone <laughs> call three days in advance to get it, and things were just so, so, so problematic. And then, there was this person who was bringing all these books saying, oh, you're writing like Davlin Thomas, oh, you're writing like Zeno, and I had never heard of them before. And then would d then open up the door for me to come here and meet all these people who have remained very, very critical and important in my life, people like Earl Lovelace and Norman Fulton and his wife, uh, you know, at the time, um, Cynthia, right? So wh who am I now? I, that was a, 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 a kind of a... Uh, uh, kind of a very young, very naive, very kind of open-minded, but very, very, very um, green artist. And now I think I might be a little ripe. <laughs> you know, you know two, yeah. things, two things really stand yeah. out. In my mind, that is, about yeah. those early years and your work. Mm -hmm. I, I think the first was that I played for you that day at the Pegasus, a recording that Mongol Patissa had done oh, with Mutsi yes. Shah. Yes, 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 yes. And Sometimes. you said, my God, I must get a copy of that. And yes, I said, yes, look, I yes. can't copy, but I will lend it to you. Yes, yes. And when you heard those chromatic scales, those yeah. chromatic scales, and you heard what yeah, the yeah. kind of crossover work being yeah, done by yeah. Mongol and by Bugsy. Yes. You were just blown away with that, mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and you began to let that seep into your poetry at the time. And mm -hmm. the second thing was, when you mm -hmm. came to me one Easter mm -hmm. and said to me that you are going away, and I said, going away where? <laughs> and you mentioned some deserted island on the Essequibo or somewhere, the Cow Island or something. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were going there to write. And I said, but, and you said, no, no, I'm going. And you went off. And then for the next four months, three, four months, I, five, six months, I did not see you. <laughs> what? <laughs> You've never spoken about that. No, what happened no, then? That was, that was my process at the time. Um, uh, really, what I would do, because I was working so hard, I was, as always, kind of doing a million things at the same time. So I was kind of 
At that time, I would have been running Guy Enterprises Television um, Studio, uh, which they, they had yes, just I set up, that, right? Yes. So I was director of television services there. Very young and set it up, right, kind of not knowing what I'm doing, but I was doing it anyway. <laughs> and, um, and so in order for me to have the space to write, um, I needed to be away from all the other distractions. But more importantly, it had to do with really my process, how I was working. Because for me, writing is a very laborious, torturous thing. Um, one of my laureates, uh, fellow laureates, the other day said to me, um, you know, well, it should be easy for you to write these 3,000 words or something, because you do it for a living. I was like, yeah, right, right? Because it's, it's for me to think about things, um, that's easy, easier. I can conceptualize very fast. I can work it in my mind. But the, to, to, to really confront a blank page with nothing written on it and then think that you have to write 30,000, 150,000 words and to be able to, to have to do that, that's always been hard for me. And the way in which I could deal with that was to lock myself away and make myself do it. Right, so those going away um, trips were about doing that, and I wanted to be able to write a certain number of um, pieces. Certainly, the longer forms, the plays, poems are not like that. I just write them, but the plays um, are kind of I have to sit myself down. Um, but over the years, with all these kind of intervening um, um, responsibilities, you're not 19 anymore. You have children. You have this. You have that. University. I don't write like that anymore. I don't have the luxury of doing it anymore. And one of the things that this Sabga has, has kind of started to make me do, which I realized as I was coming over here on the plane, is that for the first time in a long time, maybe eight, nine years, it has forced me to really think of myself again as an artist and not as an activist and has given me kind of and the more, space. More academic. Yes, and not as an academic. Well, I'm still there, but can't really divorce it. But um, but, but it's kind of made me come back to like a purest position because of the amount of writing that they're requiring from me and because I'm feeling like I should write this as, as the artist. And so I've kind of written much more and it's giving me a lot more space because I'm on sabbatical as well to do that. But coming back to this thing about going away. So now what I have to do um, is that I have to write like most other writers used to write that I read about in pieces, you know, um, kind of sequentially whenever you get a minute. So I find myself doing a lot of planning, pre-planning of writing instead of just letting whatever is inside spill out. I'm now kind of writing notes and so I can kind of remember and so on, um, which is not necessarily how I always want to do it. But, but that was, um, I had actually forgotten also about, um, about that piece of music and Pantar, you know, um, but that was like, to me, to, th to know that people, yeah, like people were actually doing this, right? Um, and I had been thinking about it, so that was that was really, really amazing. I, I seem to recall that your first book of poems, Song. That was my first though. But, but, but that, that sort of Substantial came out, book, yeah. Substantial book, that came yeah. out of that Some of the, that, some, that it's moment. you're talking about Come Fire. Come, come Fire. Come Fire, come fire come not Song. Fire. Yeah, come, come fire, fire. Came yeah, out of that definitely. Yes, yes. I come fire was that. definitely that voice. Mm -hmm. um, and kind I can of still hear certain voices of yeah, that kind yeah. resonating through your later work, uh, yeah. like your plays Chupacabra, for instance. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, your 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 plays for young people. Yeah. I can still hear some of that early voice re reverberating yeah. through that work. Is that? Yeah. A true assessment yes, to me. yes, I think so. I think that's absolutely right. In fact, um, there's a poem in in Come Fire the book that's called We, mm -hmm. and that poem really does talk about who we are as Caribbean, Ari, you know, African Indian, Amerindian, Arabi. Who are we? And it, it basically ends. The last line says, "We are we, <laughs> right? We are we. It's, the, it's not none of this kind of thing." Um, and I'm still working both as an academic and as a as a creative um, artist. Um, working on those ideas and those themes and really trying to undermine this question of separateness and um, and power over others and superiority and you know all those kinds of divisive kinds of structures that people create those that's really how I work what I'm working on so very 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 much so still still an interest now two, two other things jump out at me yes and you'll forgive me 
putting things in twos, but, they, okay. but they, they, they simply keep coming at me in twos. Mm -hmm. um, that intrigued me mm -hmm. and leave me wondering what might have led to them. Mm -hmm. And your, your, your very deep interest in them from that point on. One yeah. is your entry into the world of television <laughs> or video yes. documenting yeah. your work in the theater. Yeah. What was that again that you did? Um, this young girl Jezebel. in this whole Guyana Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel. doing this documentation of this yeah, yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, yeah. first of a kind in Guyana yeah. video yeah. play and, 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 and presenting it to the Georgetown audience. I remember that. I mean, that was mm -hmm. remarkable. What would have led to that and your continuing work in that vein subsequently? But more importantly also is your engagement with Pine Toppers in Barbados, mm -hmm. Malik Pop performers in Trinidad oh, yeah, Tobago, yes. and somebody else. Your own company, yeah. I think yes, it was. Yes. And that, that Caribbean network yes. of folk theater yes, movement. Yeah. All right. Te yeah. te te tell me something about that. Well, first of all, I was quite young and, of course, living in the world of the future and knew that once television had hit, that, um, that it would certainly begin to erode um, uh, what we knew as theater in the way that you knew theater, um, what you called it, the, the eye, right? How, how you look, the earth, right? Um, and so I knew that, and, I, and as a student of communication studies, um, I was very much um, kind of embedded in the whole culture of what was evolving with the technology, what was possible, what young people were gravitating to. So that was, that was like a natural thing. But I also understood that um, you had to be able to take the theater beyond what was the stage because there were certain limitations of the stage in terms of how people could access it, how many theaters there were and things like that. And I also wanted to be able to document what we were doing. I think my mother being a, a, a historian of, of sorts um, always made me know the value of having a document and being able to track and look back at what you're doing and so on. So that's one thing. And the second thing was the Pan-Caribbean fusion. And that was Pan not, Caribbean yes, the Pan-Caribbean. That, was, that wasn't only for, there was um, th um, this girl uh, K. Bacchus Gill. I was just asking the v Vincentian uh, laureate about K. Bacchus Gill from St. Vincent. There was oh, right. Brenda Savage from Antigua. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, there, were, uh, there were 14 islands in that fusion by the time it was built out. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I believe that we were onto something good, but we were all really young all of us, and, um, and we didn't have the resources to keep it going. But certainly, um, people like Rodney Grant and, and, and Norvin Fullerton, which was, which was really Pinelands and, and Malik, Malik, that really yes. kind, of, kind of forged that and kept doing work together, and continue to do work together kind of in an, in an informal way. I think that was a really wonderful vision, and it is something that really and truly, if you go back and look at what Errol Hill is writing about, uh, when he talks about the National Theatre uh, and, and, and so on. You're really looking at um, a National Theatre, but not for Trinidad, but for the Caribbean, which is, I think, an important project. Which is what project. Errol Hill was talking about, a National yeah. Theatre yeah. for the West Indies. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that your nonfiction, mm -hmm. your work in communication, mm -hmm. over the years would have complemented what you've done in the theatre and in your poetry. Tell me something about that. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I was one of these reluctant scientists, right? Because I <laughs> wanted to be an artist, and my mother said, you got to get the proper job, you're going to star starve. Really, that's the story. And, um, and, I, and so they made me go to university, and I wanted to be a psychologist. We didn't have the money to send me out of Guyana to study psychology, so I ended up in communications, which was the closest thing, and then I kind of meandered from communications to sociology to social psychology, which is I finally ended up where I wanted to be, in a sense. And so for me, it's always about reconciling and trying to marry what I really love to do, which is the, the theater and the arts, with what I was trained to do and what brings in the bread. And so that I, I don't really have this kind of bipolar relationship with myself, <laughs> where I'm a scientist on the one hand and, and, and this artist on the other hand, and the two things can't be reconciled. So I found a way, because communication really kind of builds out what science does and should. The best communication does that. I think I found a way to um, work with both in a compatible way, because most of what I do in science is really about changing behavior, understanding behavior, and using communication to um, 
to um, to do that. So um, I think that you know, 30 years down the line or whatever, I I I am getting to I've gotten to the point where I'm reconciling a lot of those conflicts that you know you have as a young person. Well, if I may say so, it has been quite a journey. Yeah. yeah. It has mm -hmm. been quite a journey, and I think you are now getting to the point where you are pulling all of these strands together. Yeah in a wonderful, wonderful way. Yeah, well, I, I want to thank you. I, 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 this is not, he doesn't know about this. He's going to be embarrassed, but I'm going to do this anyway. Because I want to thank Ifibo. I think a lot of people did not know what Ifibo did in Georgetown. Um, not only for me, um, but for an artist who is a wonderful artist who passed away, Mahadai Das. Um, a lot of people don't know that Ifibo would have taken Mahadai Das off the street and had, him in her, had her in his house when she couldn't. Um, she didn't have a job, she didn't have a house, and the kinds of caring that he, he showed to um, a lot of Guyanese artists, not only um, performing artists, but visual artists. I remember Nunes buying those paintings and Omawali and all those things. And so I just want to personally thank you, Ifibo, for what you did for them. I mean, in a certain sense, that kind of feel, uh, you know, for them and that caring um, is what I try to kind of emulate and to continue. So, um, you know, I guess it, it kind of pays forward. So that's it. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful.